I'd like to thank you so much for tuning into this lecture and your interest in expanding the scope of retinal disease management and advancing the profession in that way. I'm Carolyn Major, a full-time assistant professor and chief of the Retinal Disease Clinic at the Rosenberg School of Optometry, University of the Incarnate Word, where I'm fortunate enough to co-manage surgical retinal disease with ophthalmology. The purpose of this lecture is to introduce you to one of the newest and most revolutionary OCT technologies now available in the U.S., that is OCT and geography. I'll outline the clinical utility of this instrumentation and ultimately demonstrate to you how it will improve the quality of your patient care. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or confounding cases you may have. Those who know me know that there's nothing I love more than talking about OCT and geography. By way of disclosures, we have had a NIDAC AngioScan OCT and Geography system here at the school for a few years under a research glaucoma grant, and I'm a paid speaker and consultant for Zeiss. I'd like to provide you with some structure for this lecture and foreshadowing of the exciting content to come. So we'll begin with a brief anatomical review of the retinal blood supply. Then we'll talk about the technology and the different OCT systems available that have angiography capabilities. Next, we'll talk about how it works or how the OCT and geography scans are generated, which is based on a principle referred to as motion contrast. Then we'll discuss the different ways that you can view OCT and geography images and how to interpret them. We'll compare and contrast OCT and geography and conventional IV fluorescein and geography, discussing the pros and cons of each and why one technique may be preferred over the other in certain circumstances. In order to accurately interpret the imaging results, you'll need to be able to recognize artifactual patterns, and so we'll review artifacts unique to OCT and geography. And saving the best for last, we'll look at clinical applications of OCT and geography and findings in various disease states. Recall that the neurosensory retina is nourished by a dual blood supply, consisting of both the central retinal artery, which supplies the inner layers of the retina, and the choroid, which supplies the outer layers of the retina. The central retinal artery gives rise to three main capillary networks. The first is the radial peripapillary capillary plexus that nourishes the nerve fiber layer. It therefore is most dense where the nerve fiber layer is thickest in the peripapillary area and the proximal temporal arcades depicted here in red. The second is the superficial capillary plexus located in the nerve fiber layer or the ganglion cell layer. And last, the deep capillary plexus located in the inner nuclear layer. Recall that endothelial cells of the central retinal artery system are unfenestrated and joined by tight junctions that form the inner blood retinal barrier. This barrier is compromised in various disease states in which bleeding or fluid enters the retina, such as diabetic retinopathy or retinal venous occlusive disease. So by way of introduction, OCT angiography is non-invasive since no dye injection is required, which avoids the potential side effects of conventional IV fluorescein angiography, such as anaphylaxis, nausea, vomiting, extravasation, etc. Its non-invasive nature also allows us to perform imaging even when it's not deemed medically necessary to the diagnosis or treatment of the condition, but we simply want to gain a better understanding of what's going on with the retinal circulation. And flow imaging, uh, what I mean by that is that OCT angiography is not a true form of angiography. Because there's no dye injection required, we're not watching where dye traverses over time, but instead visualizing a snapshot of how fast red blood cells are traveling in a vessel lumen at the moment the scan was taken. Similar to the conventional OCT macular cube scan that we're all used to, we end up with a volumetric cube of data that allows us to segment out and isolate particular capillary systems, such as the superficial capillary plexus of the central retinal artery, the deep capillary plexus of the central retinal artery, the choriocapillaris, and the choroid. Most OCT and geography systems display conventional structural OCT data and angiography data side by side, and these can even be superimposed upon one another. This allows for precise localizations of vascular lesions, such as a choroidal neovascular membrane underlying a pigment epithelial detachment and potential sources of macular edema. Both are the case here. Currently, three FDA-cleared OCT and geography systems are commercially available for purchase in the U.S. The Zeiss Angioplex available on the Cirrus 5000 HD OCT instrument, the OptiView Angioview available on the Avanti, 
and the Heidelberg OCT and Geography module available on the Spectralis. Several other systems are either still in development or awaiting FDA clearance, such as the NIDAC AngioScan and the angiography component of the TopCon Triton Swept Source OCT. The hard and software of OCT and geography technology are nearly identical to that used to acquire a traditional macular cube scan, except for doing it four times consecutively. And those four scans are then compared and any differences are assumed to be due to movement of red blood cells. So essentially, we're generating a 3D volumetric map of red blood cell movement. Similar to how a fluorescein angiography camera is designed to only capture fluorescein dye fluorescence because of excitatory and barrier filters, OCT angiography only captures movement. So if you scan the eye, say, of a dead person, which hopefully you know, none of us are doing out in, in practice, the theory is that that image would be totally black because there is no red blood cell movement in that eye. An inherent challenge of OCT and geography systems is finding a way to display 3D volumetric data in a 2D format that is easy for clinicians to understand and analyze. The most common way of viewing OCT and geography data is using preset InFOS images. An InFOS image represents a slab of data, including several retinal layers, that's compressed down into a 2D plane and presented in face. InFOS images can be used to visualize angiography data or conventional structural data. The two are usually displayed side by side. For example, on the left here is an InFOS OCT angiogram, and on the right is the corresponding structural InFOS image generated with identical segmentation boundaries, which are shown here below. Most instruments have preset InFOS image displays that can each be enlarged and analyzed when selected. Although the names and exact boundaries of preset InFOS image displays vary depending on the OCT and geography system that you're using, I'll review some of the common and more universal ones with you using an example of a 3 millimeter macular scan. The left image represents the segmentation boundaries of the slab in purple overlaid on a structural B-scan image. On the right is the corresponding InFOS OCT angiogram. The first and most anterior InFOS image is the vitreous or the vitreoretinal interface, VRI. This includes data from the vitreous just anterior to the internal limiting membrane of the retina. In a healthy eye, the vitreoretinal interface should be void of signal or black since no vascular movement occurs in the vitreous. It is therefore particularly useful for detecting and visualizing preretinal neovascularization. Recall that preretinal neovascularization is characterized by new blood vessel growth anterior to the internal limiting membrane of the retina. Here is an example of an area of preretinal neovascularization or neovascularization elsewhere in one of my diabetic patients. You can see how the neovascular membrane is readily detected and isolated out on the vitreoretinal retinal interface image. You can also see how the membrane itself is growing on the posterior hyaloid of the retina and is therefore detected in this InFOS display. Moving from anterior to posterior, the next InFOS image is the superficial retina, which is a compression of the nerve fiber, ganglion cell, and interplexiform layers. This isolates out the superficial capillary plexus of the central retinal artery and highlights the contour and size of the normal foveoid vascular zone. Next is the deep retina, which represents a compression of the inner nuclear and the outer plexiform layers that isolates out the deep capillary plexus of the central retinal artery. Here the capillaries are organized into many tufts or vortexes and the normal foveoid vascular zone can again be visualized. Moving along, we have the avascular or outer retinal infos display. The name and segmentation boundaries vary depending upon the instrument that you're using, but all include some combination of photoreceptors and RPE. These structures are normally avascular and therefore the display should be black or void of signal. This infos display was specifically designed to aid in the detection of choroidal neovascular membranes. Here's an example of an eye with AMD and a very small choroidal neovascular membrane, the circular cluster of vessels here. You can really appreciate how the neovascular membrane is readily detected and isolated out on the avascular infos display. This is the normal static and granulated appearance of the choroidal capillaris. This infos display is also useful for imaging choroidal neovascularization 
in addition to the avascular or outer retinal in FOSS display. These large dark vessels here are shadow artifacts of the overlying uh, central retinal artery vessels. And lastly, this is the choroid, which typically looks like large static or speckle on this magnified three by three millimeter scan. Few OCT angiography systems, including the OptiView AngioView and the NIDAC AngioScan, include predefined in-FOSS angiograms for optic nerve scans that include visualization of the radial peripapillary capillaries that are often affected in optic nerve disease, such as glaucoma. Some systems, such as the Zeiss Angioplex, will allow you to play a video that contains an in-FOSS image at the top that changes as a thin segmentation slab is moved from anterior to posterior. This gives you a quick overview of the depth of localization of vascular lesions. Lastly, the user can superimpose vascular information on cross-sectional B-scans, allowing for precise localization of vascular lesions. So here at the top is our conventional structural B-scan, and on the bottom, the red overlay represents areas of red blood cell movement. Here we have an example of two eyes, each with pigment epithelial detachments. Here we can see them. The top image contains a perfused choroidal neovascular membrane, which may require treatment. We know that because of this red overlay or red hue of the membrane itself, and the other on the bottom is a vascular. And here we have an example of two eyes with prepapillary uh, tissue extending into the posterior vitreous. The top is neovascularization of the disc, again because of this reddish pink overlay, while the bottom image contains a Bergmeister's papilla or just a congenital remnant of the hyaloid artery that is non-perfused. Let's now compare and contrast OCT angiography to traditional IV fluorescein angiography. We'll first talk about the advantages of OCT angiography. First and foremost, no dye injection is required, thus the procedure is non-invasive and can be performed even when not medically necessary. Without the dye injection, we also avoid the side effects of both the dye and the injection procedure. It can also be performed safely on children and pregnant patients. OCT angiography takes just seconds compared to IV fluorescein angiography, which requires that the late phase photographs be taken at about 5 or 10 minutes after the injection. Volumetric data is acquired with OCT and geography that allows for isolation of various retinal capillary plexuses and abnormal vasculature such as neovascular membranes. OCT and geography provides higher microvascular resolution that highlights even very subtle subclinical vascular pathology. Here you can really appreciate the exquisite details of the capillaries on the optic nerve and peripapillary retina with OCT angiography compared to the comparison IV fluorescein angiography image. OCT angiography provides precise delineation and measurement of neovascular membranes, uh, and I'm going to mention it here on the next slide, but leakage of neovascular membranes is not, not imaged with OCT angiography. This is an advantage in the sense that dye leakage frequently obscures details of underlying neovascular membranes and makes precise delineation of the membranes themselves difficult. Higher resolution imaging with neovascular membranes means more accurate measurements of membrane size and responsiveness to treatment over time. Let's now talk about some of the disadvantages of OCT angiography compared to IV fluorescein angiography. So OCT angiography imaging generally provides a smaller field of view compared to IV fluorescein angiography, but this has already largely been overcome by larger scan sizes and montage software capable of knitting several scans together. Of course, keep in mind that the larger the single scan size, generally the lower the microvascular resolution. So on most systems, a three by three millimeter scan is gonna give you the highest resolution, particularly of the foveal vascular zone. Because OCT and geography cannot capture slow extravascular flow of clear fluid, conventional IV fluorescein angiography late stage hyperfluorescence patterns such as leakage, pooling, or staining will not be imaged with OCT and geography. This inability to image late stage leakage has both the disadvantages and advantages. The advantages we already discussed that it doesn't obscure our view of choroidal neovascular membranes themselves, which allows for precise delineation and measurement of choroidal neovascular membrane size. 
But the disadvantages is that the presence of leakage on IV fluorescein in angiography can be used to detect subtle areas of neovascularization or sources of macular edema. Therefore, it may be difficult to detect neovascularization without leakage or plan focal laser treatment for macular edema. OCT angiography motion detection has a fast flow and a slow flow cutoff, so vascular structures with very fast blood flow, such as the larger choroidal vessels, are poorly imaged. Likewise, vascular structures with very slow flow, such as microaneurysms, fibrotic choroidal neovascular membranes, or capillaries within areas of ischemia, um, such as...